Hello! In this video, we will tackle the problem known as Mollinger's Theorem. So suppose you were to draw three circles in a plane, such that no circle has the same radii and no circle is inside another. In this problem, we call our circles P, Q, and R. Now suppose that we draw the three common external tangents to each pair of circles, such that they intersect at points outside. So we end up having one around circles P and R, Q and R, and P and Q. And again for this problem, let us label these points as Z1, Z2, and Z3. Monge's theorem states that these three outside points are collinear. So how do we go about proving this? Well, we have some expressions for proving collinearity between three points, but we don't know much about Z1, Z2, or Z3 themselves. We try and find ways to express them in terms that we already know, which in this case are the centers and radii of the circles. We start by examining Z3. Triangles have been helpful in the past, so we draw a triangle using a radius of P and a line from P to Z3. It seems like the line PZ3 goes through Q, which we can easily prove. In fact, by constructing four triangles like this, we can prove a few things. First, recall that any tangent is perpendicular to the radius where it touches the circle, so all our triangles are right triangles. Furthermore, by the hypotenuse-like congruence theorem, we see that we have pairs of congruent triangles, so the smallest angle of each triangle is also congruent. This means that both P and Q lie on the angle bisector of Z3, so P, Q, and Z3 must be collinear. Moving on, we turn our attention back to the triangles at hand and label the radii A and B respectively. Since we know that P, Q, and Z3 are collinear, we know that Z3 minus P over Q minus P is a real number. Additionally, since we just prove P, Q, and Z to be collinear, we know that the ratio of Z3 minus P over Q minus P equals the ratio of PZ3 over PQ. This makes intuitive sense, but we can also visualize it with vectors. Here I've drawn out several cases for three points, P, Q, and Z3, which are collinear, shown as the solid blue purple lines above, along with separate vectors for Q, P, and Z3 respectively. We can perform vector subtraction by adding the negative of the vector we want to subtract to the head of the other vector, which we do here with P, so negative P is shown in red. The dotted lines show the end vectors of Q minus P and Z3 minus P respectively, and we can see more or less that the ratios correspond with the ratios of PQ and PZ3, or really since we show them as vectors, we have vector Q minus P equal vector PQ and vector Z3 minus P equal vector PZ. There is probably a more in-depth proof and explanation for what's shown in this diagram, but that's not the focus of this video. Focusing back to our diagram, we have similar triangles QZ3Y and PZ3X. This gives us the ratio of sides QZ3 over PZ3 as B over A. However, we're interested in the ratio involving PQ and PZ3, which we can now write in terms of B and A with some substitution. We see that PQ is equal to PZ3 minus QZ3, which we can use to our advantage and separate out into a difference of two fractions and rewrite as B minus A as sorry as A minus B over A. We can now set this ratio equal to our expression with Z3, keeping in mind that it is now A over A minus B because we want the ratio PZ3 over PQ, not PQ over PZ3. Solving for Z3 gives us AQ minus BP over A minus B. So now that we have Z3 in terms of A, B, Q, and P, we can go back to our original diagram and by using the same process write Z2 and Z1 in a similar fashion. Now that we have all our Z's written in more manageable terms, we can start thinking about how to prove their collinearity. We learned that if we use this expression, involving each point in its conjugate, and prove it equals zero, the three points must be collinear. We could start plugging and chugging here, but with our points in their current form, we'd be here a while, and it doesn't look like much fun. Instead, let's look for ways to simplify this expression. There are quite a few terms here, but we can see that Z2 and its conjugate appear in every parentheses. One way to simplify this expression would be to factor out Z2 by having it be a real number, since every real number is equal to its conjugate. But we can go a step further. 
Since we're solving this problem by using numbers on the complex plane, we assign z2 to be the origin. This way, not only is z2 equal to its conjugate, but it's equal to a particularly useful number, 0. This cuts out a lot of our work and simplifies the expression to z1 conjugate z3 minus conjugate z1 z3. But wait! Letting z2 be the origin helps us in more ways than one. We can now set our equation for z2 equal to 0 and solve for r. We can now substitute this value of r back into our equation for z1, and with the vitter factoring, write it as a product of the radii a, b, and c, and an expression involving the centers q and p. This doesn't seem helpful until we realize we can do the same thing for z3, and factor it in a similar fashion. So we've written z1 and z3 in yet another form. Now do we want to calculate our expression for collinearity? As it turns out, we don't have to. If we think back to section 8.2, we recall that a line through two points crosses through the origin if and only if the quotient is real. Letting z2 be the origin pays off yet again as we divide z1 by z3. We can now see that our factoring paid off, and we're left with an expression which only has the radii of the circles. This brings us to an important point. Since the radii of the circles are all real numbers, this expression must be real. And this expression is real if and only if the line through z1 and z2 passes through the origin. And since z2 is the origin, it therefore lies on that line. So z1, z2, and z3 must be collinear. And there we have our proof. The outside points where the three pairs of tangents meet all lie on the same line. So some general problem solving strategies we can take from this are draw familiar shapes to find relations. In this case we use triangles to help us find similar ratios to the sides. And then if you can graph the problem, think about where to assign the origin or some other convenient value. Lastly, always look for simpler ways to solve a problem. We could have gone and plugged and chugged all day, but the way we did it ultimately ended up being much easier. And now I'd like to end this video by saying that this problem isn't restricted to the two-dimensional plane. If you had three spheres um, and three cones which follow the properties of the circles and tangents, the vertices of the cones would all lie in a straight line. And I have a little diagram of this here. It's just kind of a cool fact and shows that a problem can be tackled in many different ways. Thank you and goodbye.